Hello and welcome back to my RC channel. I'm Andy RC and today I'm going to be shopping for, building, setting up and flying a freestyle copter that costs 100 GBP. Now we have two copters here. One costs 100 GBP and the other one costs 450 GBP. Can you guess which one it is? It is this one. This is my KISS Alien build. And yeah, it was expensive, and when I did my video on it, people got very angry. I think it was because they thought they got clickbaited, because I said it cost $2,300, and that is because I included the transmitter, the crossfire, the HDOs, and I also think people got angry because we want people to get into the hobby. And when you see a figure like that, you just think, forget it. And that was not my intention of that video. In fact, my intention was this video because this copter costs 100 GBP and it has got exactly the same specs as this one. So we have got two 306 2500 kV motors, we have got a 600 milliwatt VTX, we have got a CCD camera up the front there, and we have got a freestyle frame. Now the 100 GBP model actually weighs around about 20 grams lighter than the KISS model and another reason I wanted to build this guy was for myself because when the KISS model gets broken when I'm trying to go through gaps it's very expensive and as you can see it's broken at the moment and I have to fix it and I think that is the problem with freestyle and I know a lot of people get angry when you use cloned parts but you know it's so expensive every time you crash so if you are a beginner and you are crashing a lot then it's cheaper to replace the parts. Now I've been working on this for such a long time to get it right for you guys so I already put up some flight footage and I asked you guys to guess which one you thought was the expensive one and which one was the cheap one and it was 50-50 on who got it right and I have to say I cannot tell the difference in flight characteristics between these two. Now you might be thinking as well Andy why are you going for these heavy freestyle quads we can go much lighter now and it's all to do with flying with friends this year so I've been out to a lot of different spots and great epic locations and I always took a race copter with me and I always got the props in the shot and race copters are lighter and that means that when you go around a corner they kind of jitter they aren't as smooth and there is a benefit to having a heavier copter you don't get the prop wash oscillations on corners and you tend to get smoother footage and of course as I already mentioned you don't get the props in shot and having a top mounted battery also means that you can bounce off walls and people are even talking about grinding now as well so I'm a big fan of the freestyle copter and I'm also a big fan of the race copter but I think we need both of them and one thing that you won't see in these cheap builds is DVR footage. Usually they show the GoPro footage, but for me it's really important to have clean video or at least the cleanest video that you can get for the money. And this isn't having a go at anyone in particular, it's just something that is important to me and it is why I am making this video. So without further ado, let's get started. Alrighty, let's do some shopping. Now I'm going to be showing three different sets of components, but I'm only going to be building one of them. But, you know, over the time I have been doing this, I have tried out a lot of components, so I kind of know the ones that work well. And I'm starting off with the cheapest set. Now, unfortunately, we are a couple of days past Banggood's Black Friday deals so the prices have 
elevated a little bit, but if you use my code RC Andy, then you do get 10% off the Mamba ESC and flight controller combo, and also 10% off the anniversary special edition of the Martian, but I'll get onto that later. So, this first set of components, I have chosen the Racer Star 2205 motors. However, I would say at this point, don't bother with them because last week they were £20 and it was worth the buy but now they're £25 and for £5 more there is a motor that will absolutely blow these out of the sky but if you are on a seriously tight budget then they still work and these motors are going to work fine they're just not going to have as much power as the ones that are going to be in my build so this VTX, it's the Ishin VTX 03, but it's the super version and it has smart audio. Now it only goes up to 200 milliwatt, so it's not going to compete with my Alien, which goes up to 600 milliwatt. But again, if you are on a budget, it is pretty cheap and it runs off 5 volts, which is good because the F4 flight controller here only has a 5 volt back so you can connect this VTX directly to it the only thing I will say though is that this stack is actually made by Diatone and Diatone have done a lot of work to get rid of video noise the stack comes with a low ESR capacitor but if you go directly from the back then you will get noise coming through. So what Diatone did is they made this board because they used the Unify. And this board eradicates all noise completely with the Unify. It's fantastic. And it's very cheap as well without the Unify. Now I can't confirm whether this is going to clean up the noise with the VTX-03, but I thought it'd be worth a mention if you want to go down that route. Otherwise, I do think you are going to get noise plugging this directly into the 5 volt of the flight controller. So, the camera. For me, it's really important to have a decent camera, so I've chosen the HS1177. It's been around for ages. It is the V2 version and it's very cheap, £15. I personally wouldn't go for one of the really cheap CMOS cameras. They are just terrible and you can actually get this in a micro version, but I go for the full size version because it's going to fit the Martian frame better and the micro version though is the same price but you'd have to get an adapter so the frame very controversial because the martian is a clone of the alien frame however this is the anniversary edition and it's the 215 millimeter version and i think now it is different enough to say that it is inspired by rather than a clone. But if you are against cloning completely, then there are some other options now, especially from Team Black Sheep. They have the Source 1, which is $26, and it's a freestyle frame. And then the Rotor Riot have got the CL1, and that's $34. So, if you are not into this anniversary edition, then you have those other options, but £16 there, and then with the coupon as well, that is just really cheap. And the quality now compared to the original Martian is absolutely fantastic. And I cannot tell the difference when flying this copter against the expensive KISS model. So that is why I have chosen the Martian. 
Right, so the next one is the one that I'm going to build and there's actually only a couple of changes. So I'm choosing the Samguk 2306-2500kV motors. They are just absolutely fantastic. They are smooth as they have got a naked bottom. Absolutely fantastic. And you know on my KISS build I think the motors are 16 quid a corner. These must be, what, six, seven quid a corner. Absolutely fantastic. And then for the VTX, I'm using the iFlight Force VTX 804. Now, the reason that I've chosen this one is I used it on another model and it was very good at noise reduction. It was plugged in directly to the, I think it was called the Hobby Mate Comet. And that was without a capacitor and there was no noise whatsoever and it's 600 milliwatt and it gets very close to that I think around about 562 milliwatt on my power meter and it also comes with a extension cable it's actually not this cable it's an SMA cable that it comes with so yeah, those are the two changes, but other than that, I'm going to be using the Mamba ESC and also the Alien Frame and the Foxeer camera as well. Now you might be thinking, Andy, why don't you use the Ishin TX5258? It is cheaper and it's 800 milliwatts. Well, actually it's not. I did a test and it went up to I think 500 milliwatts not 800 and it also doesn't have the holes to fit on a stack and it also doesn't have a pigtail so if you stick this at the back of the copter and have a crash then you can break this whereas with the iFlight one the pigtail is the thing that is going to break and you can replace that so yeah it is more expensive but it performs better and to me it's a better option but you know if you don't agree go with this guy absolutely fine but in my build we're going to be using this one but Andy, what about the AKK FX2 Ultimate Mini? It is the same price as the iFlight board and it goes up to a thousand milliwatts. And yeah, you've got me there. The reason that I'm not using this VTX is I don't have one, so I don't know how it performs. People tell me that they perform great, so I'm actually going to order one. The only thing I will say is that in power tests I've only seen it reach 800 milliwatt and there isn't a lot of difference between 600 milliwatt and 800 milliwatt. There's actually not much difference between 600 milliwatt and 1000 milliwatt because it is logarithmic not linear. So for example, on the Ultimate, which goes up to 1.2 watts, that sounds double than 600 milliwatts, and in numbers it is, but in power it is not. So I'm absolutely happy with the iFlight board. And one thing that I like about this board as well is that it doesn't have any components underneath. And this is going to be sat on top of a flight controller that is going to be giving off RF noise and if we go back here to the FX2 Ultimate if we look underneath we have got some components and I don't have any experience in this so I'm just guessing but if we do get some noise coming off that flight controller then it's going to affect these components and we may get some noise but for this video I'm going to be sticking with the iFlight board now there is a third build and it's going to be more expensive by the way this build I'm calling the 100 quid build but it's now 110 because the prices have changed but what I will say is go and take a look at some of those $99 builds out there and 
add up the totals, I think you'll find they don't come anywhere near to $99. But anyways, I'm not having a go. 110 quid for a copter that flies like a model that costs, you know, 450 quid is a good deal in my books. But anyways, yes, the third one for me, which would make it the perfect copter, would be to change out the stack. And I would go for the Airbot Omnibus F4. And that is because... It has got a 9 volt regulator, so you can plug your VTX in there, and it's using what they are calling the Typhoon 32 ESCs. They have got so much filtering on there, and there is so little noise. I think they are actually a copy of the Teco 32, which are known for being some of the best 4-in-1 ESCs out there. So that's the only thing I would change, but it does put the price up to 133 quid, and you do not get the discount using my code with that stack. Yeah, so this code here, it only takes money off the frame and also the Mamba stack. So, you're probably thinking at this point, well, what about all of the other stuff? Well, when I did my video on my KISS Alien and included things like the receiver, crossfire, the transmitter, the goggles, people started accusing me of, you know, oh, what, are you going to include your computer, your house, your shoes? So, I'm not including that in this build, but what I will do is I have got a list of stuff that I would use if I wanted to go cheap. So I would go with the Flysky i6X with the i6X receiver. The goggles, I would go for the Ishin EV800D. We do have a lot of goggles coming out such as the Top Sky Prime looks like a, a good one, but I haven't reviewed that yet. I reviewed this one and, you know, it's a good box goggle, so I would go with that. Antennas, I would go with the Omways. And then for the battery mat, I would go with this one here so that it doesn't slip. In the build video, I actually used the, oh my god, sticky grip thing, uh, but Usually, I use this one. So, for the battery straps, I like to use these because they've got the checker on there, and I love checker, and it is the closest battery strap that matches the logo on my channel. And then, for the props, I actually like to use these wizard ones, but they are the Dal Cyclone. They are the... T5046, but you can't get them in the clear edition anywhere else other than if you buy the Ishin Wizard ones, which is a shame. So, you know, you can get them cheaper if you don't want them clear, but I like to have them clear because if you use Superview, you can sometimes get the props in shot slightly, and if they are clear, then you can't see them as much. So, for the GoPro mount, I always use Brain 3D, and they do one for the Martian, and it fits the Anniversary Edition. Now, I haven't used that in this video because it hasn't turned up yet. In fact, I think I used one for the Floss, but yeah, they are some of the best, and I'm going to be picking the Violet one. Now, I changed out the low ESR capacitor that came with the Mamba ESC. It didn't make much of a difference, but I like to use the Panasonic FM series, the 1000 microfarad 35 volt. I get these from eBay. As I say, it didn't make much of a difference. And, you know, the noise isn't bad at all on this copter, as you will see later, but it isn't completely noise-free. I did want it to be noise-free, but I'm afraid if you want to get it completely noise-free, 
then you're going to have to go with that other stack that I showed you. Now I like to use heat shrink around the arms to keep the motor wires nice and neat but unfortunately it looks like the size that I bought some time ago doesn't exist anymore which is 33 millimeters in diameter and I know I got it off eBay but I don't think that matters because you can still buy heat shrink and I think the one that I used was actually a little bit too big so I always go for clear and we have got the size here 25.4 millimeters in diameter that is unshrunk so if we come down here it tells you what it shrinks to now the arms on the Martian don't get any wider than 20 millimeters so this will still fit over the top and it says that it shrinks down to 12.7 millimeters now the narrowest point on the Martian's arm is 19 millimeters but you don't have to shrink it down to its maximum shrink amount so I think this will be okay as for the GoPro session 5 there is no competition in my opinion unfortunately and they have been discontinued now I usually search on eBay for refurbished ones and I actually got a great deal I think I bought three of them at a hundred pound each and I found this one on this website website here 114 pounds I might go for that but sadly as they become rarer and rarer because they're discontinued the prices are going up rather than down I would also recommend that you get a tempered glass screen for it as well so when you hit something it is that that breaks and not the GoPro and while I'm here I might as well mention you're gonna need a charger I've used this one in the past it's really cheap it is the Charsoon DC 2-4S charger and it comes with a AC power pack so you don't have to have anything else like a power unit to power up you're gonna need some batteries now this model is going to be drawing some very high amps so I recommend a 1500 I don't think a 1300 will be able to cope with it in fact if we go to the calculator here so yeah I use these GMB batteries by the way 1500 but it's very difficult to get them in the UK so I get them off eBay rather than Banggood but sometimes it's better to source batteries locally as well it can end up cheaper but yes the reason why a 1300 is no good and I use these Funfly batteries by Tattoo as well these are pretty cheap but if this copter is drawing 137 amps around about there if we go 1300 times by 100 C which this one is that is 130 amps so you're going to get a bit of battery sag there but if we take a 1550 and times that by 100 we have 155 amps so that is going to be much more suitable for our amp heavy copter oh and by the way for all of the people that commented on the kiss video at this point you need all of this stuff to fly if you don't have any one of these things you are not going to get in the air but if you are interested my shoes are the vans classic slip my computer is a i7-7700K with a NVIDIA 1080 Ti and it's a three-bedroomed house.
So let's get on to the build and the first thing to do is to put the heat shrink over the arms because you can't do it at any other time and as you can see the arms don't lock in the center like the original Alien. You're only given three different sizes of screws which I like. This is the longest one for the arms and you're given some nuts. Don't tie it up fully yet because you want a little bit of movement to get that second one in. The only thing I will say though is because the arms don't lock, you do need to tighten them up really tight otherwise they will move and make sure that the arms are as far outside as possible because if you use a 5.1 prop then they can catch on the standoffs if you don't do that. The next thing I'm doing is taking apart the stack so that we can fit it through the frame and you can see we just have this wire here so I'm gonna disconnect that and these are the slightly shorter screws for the standoffs to sit on and they give you some nylon standoffs that fit as well be careful not to have them too tight because it's metal going into nylon and you can ruin the thread that's all of those that have gone in there and then you're given these o-rings so i'm putting those on there and then the esc board fits on the top of there make sure you get it the right direction now i'm feeding the motor wires through the heat shrink and fitting the motors these are 2.5 mil hex screws so you need to use a different tool for that and that is all of those that have gone in they aren't directional so you don't need to worry about that and now i'm tinning up the escs now they recommend that you tin up the underside of the escs because the nylon standoffs are difficult to screw in they get in the way of the solder but i found a little bit of force and it wasn't a problem and it's more difficult to solder the wires from the underneath so now i am cutting the wires to length and tinning them up we've got silicon wires despite the price which is just fantastic and yeah cutting all of these up and stripping them here be careful not to melt the standoff when you are doing it but the other two are actually quite far away from the standoff. But yes, you need to tin it up and then solder it in. And I do that for all of them. I'm not going to make you watch me do that. So that's the last one going in there. Now I'm cutting to length the low ESR capacitor. And I'm tinning that up. But I end up using a different one. And now I'm using a spare bit of cable that I've got. It's got the wrong connector on it, so ignore that. But I don't have any 14 gauge wire. I think this is 12, so it's a little bit thick, but it was still fine. So just soldering that on to the back there. And now soldering the capacitor on. The line on the side is the negative side. So make sure you get that right. Otherwise you will get a bang. So now I am removing the standoffs from the flight controller. And as you can see it's a bit of a struggle to screw them in to the ESCs. And then the flight controller fits on the top there and it plugs straight into the ESC board. So I'm using the RXSR and I'm removing the S bus in wire because we don't need it. But one thing I forgot to do was to remove the S port pin and solder it to the uninverted pad on the receiver. You need to do that because it is uninverted on the flight controller and you'll see later where I do that. But yeah, I'm using my own heat shrink here and it just plugs in on the RXSR there. So I'm actually using hot glue to fix it in place. Don't use hot glue, it's rubbish on carbon. Use a cable tie like I have here and you can see we've got the yellow S-port wire also soldered in there now as well. 
So now I'm tinning up everything on the board. This is actually for the receiver to go in there and I'm feeding the cables through and also underneath the flight controller so that I can have it nice and neat. Then I'm cutting them to length. The yellow wire, as I say, is the S port, a little bit confusing against the others. The green is the S bus and just tinning that up there and putting that into place with my shaky hands and some tweezers. And then this is the 5 volt going in there. And then this is the ground that I'm cutting up and tinning it up and then soldering that into place as well. So this is the board and the PPM pad we can ignore unless you're using a PPM receiver. The RX1 is the inverted S bus and then we have the TX6 for the smart port that I used and we've also got a 3.3 volt there as well for DSMX. Down here we've got VCC and ground and we've got some nicely placed pads here for crossfire and I'd also use Flysky here as well. So yeah, nice options there. We've also got a five volt for the LED board if you want to use LEDs. And then up here we have got the VTX. So vid is actually video out. TX3 is for your smart audio. And then ground and five volt, that's for the Unify board that Diatone use. So lastly, we have got the pads for the camera. So we've got camera in, we've got ground and 5 volt, and there's also a buzzer option as well if you want to use that. So next, I am removing the 5 volt out for my VTX because I'm not going to be using it. And then I'm tinning up the VTX pads here, and I'm also tinning up the camera pads. Now I'm putting some nylon standoffs on the top there. This is just so that I can measure the wires for the VTX and then cut them to length there. So just doing that and stripping them and then tinning them up. And then that's the video going in. That is the smart audio and then that is the ground and I'm just fitting that into place so that I can measure the VBAT. It's best to have the VBAT going directly to the capacitor, otherwise you can get inductance if you put it on the VCC. So yeah, it worked best if you solder it direct to the capacitor there and then I am putting on the standoffs for the VTX to sit on in the end. So the camera is now getting screwed in to the camera plate using a Phillips screwdriver and then I'm cutting that to length and then those wires need to be stripped as well. All silicon wires, not bad for the price. And then I am tinning that up as well. So that is the video going in. And then that is the ground. Be careful not to bridge them. And then that is the 5 volt. Now I'm cutting off this hefty connector here to put on the correct one and yeah just stripping those wires as well. Now I'm using my own heat shrink here and this is actually the XT60 that they give you in the package but the wires sadly aren't long enough to come out of the side which is why I've used my own cables. Just tinning that up there and then put in the heat shrink over the top and then I'm just checking the length is fine and now I'm soldering in the positive there and the negative and the wires are just a little bit too thick 
to fit the recess, but it doesn't matter. So now I'm experimenting by removing the capacitor that comes with the Mamba and I'm installing a Panasonic one, but really it didn't make much difference. So I'm not sure I'd recommend doing that. And of course, you know, I need to solder back my VTX to it. Now Diatone also use these 47 microfarad low ESR capacitors on the 5 volt and I thought I would try it to eradicate noise but it didn't do anything so don't bother doing that unless you plan on using the diatone board so these are the nuts that are going on the top of the stack there for the VTX and now I'm screwing in the standoffs so that the top plate can fit on the top and the screws are so much better quality and so are the standoffs as well I was really really impressed with it it's a little bit awkward with the camera hanging at the front there but yeah just hand tighten them for now and of course later you need to tighten them up with a tool so now I am routing the SMA adapter and then screwing that on the top of the plate by hand for now of course you need to tighten that up later as well it's a little bit awkward getting this plate on here but again just putting the screws in be careful that you don't snap off the tabs on the camera plate at the front make sure they are in place but everything is now taking shape i'm just tightening up everything at the bottom there and make sure that you tighten up the screws and the nuts as well and that the arms are out as far as possible so that your props don't catch on the standoffs and yeah I am now getting very close to finishing the build just using a candle lighter to sort out the heat shrink and holding the motors nice and neat there and I'm now using a socket set to tighten up the SMA connector at the back and make sure you put your antenna on before you power anything up very important otherwise you will destroy your VTX and now I'm using some cable ties for the RXSR I actually got really poor RSSI values with the RXSR and I find that and they tell me it's because it works differently with the DB so don't worry about it and this is the oh my god sticky pad thing it's not part of the budget but there you go that is the build complete now I know there is something that is going to trigger people at this point because these days it is common practice to not have your antenna coming up here. It's common practice to have it coming out of the back and the reason for that is when you have a crash it can knock off the antenna and break it. But what I find is that with a top mounted battery when you have your antenna coming out of the back you get really poor reception because your GoPro and your battery is in the way and I like to fly a fairly low angle so when the antenna is out the back here the majority of the time the battery and the GoPro is covering it so I like to have my antenna up high so that I get really good reception and if it hits something or breaks I have got a pigtail here so I don't mind replacing that in fact that has happened it has never broken the plate so far it's only ever broken the antenna but I thought I would address it and if you want to have your antenna coming out here that's absolutely fair enough but I prefer to get better video reception oh by the way if you are wondering why I have a capacitor here with a cable tie around it and also one here is because I was experimenting but it didn't make a difference. Next we have the transmitter setup for FreeSky 
So I have called the model the Mart 2 because I have built another Martian in the past. So what we need to do is we need, well, we need the external RF turned off. We need the failsafe at no pulses and then we want the channel range as 1 to 8 because it gives us the lowest latency and then we want D16. Now to bind you're going to want to press this button here and you're going to want telemetry on if you are using the RXSR and you're going to want telemetry off if you're using the XM series because well it's pointless because it's not a telemetry receiver. At the same time you're going to want to plug in the battery of your copter while at the same time pressing the bind button which is very fiddly and then you're going to want to press exit out of the bind option so once you have done that what i would do next is discover the sensors so if we page back here i've already done it on this one but if you plug the copter in and press discover sensors and you're using telemetry then you should get all of your telemetry information i do this just for the rssi so that i can output it on channel 8 and i'll show you how to do that and that is so that we can have it on the on-screen display so if i just exit out of there and then page over to the inputs I have got it on channel 8 so if we go in here like so and I think I called it R actually but for some reason it's deleted it and if we check out the source then you can select RSSI now if you don't discover sensors first then you won't be able to see RSSI you also need to set the scale to 100 dB and then if I exit out of that and go into the mixer I will go down to channel 8 I'll show you how I set the switches up as well but I'll show you this first so if we're going to edit you can see the mixer name that it selected is R and you need to change the weight to 200 and the offset to minus 100 and then that will output the RSSI value on the AUX4 which we will select in beta flight later okay so the switches so channel 5 here and this is in the mixer screen still if I go into there I call my arming option A because I'm too lazy to type arm and then in the source if you just press enter you can select the switch I have it on this two position switch here and that's that sorted so the next one I have as my modes and again I just put M because I'm lazy and then the source I have on this switch here like that and it automatically selects it and then lastly on channel 7 I call that B for buzzer and it's going to be D shot commands for this copter but it will still work and is very loud and I have that on this one and then if you want to do Lua scripts you're gonna to want to download the beta flight Lua script and install it on the micro SD card in the scripts section and to do that you need to put both of the trims in on there and then switch it on. It'll go into bootloader mode. You can plug in your USB connector and you can do it that way or you can take the SD card out there. And of course in order to get the Lua script working then you're going to want to page over again and then where it says screen 1 under script select BF Lua. So if we now long press the page button, you can see I now have my PIDs on there and I can go in and change them if I want. And if I press the menu button, we've got other things such as our rates that we can change and, you know, 
all sorts of other settings like that. In order to set up the i6X for iBus output, I just need to set the output on the transmitter to PPM. Turn the i6X on and then long press the OK button and then press OK again to go into the system menu. If you go into model select, you can see I'm starting on model 1. But if you want to change the model, you have a 20 model memory to select from. Any option is only ever changed with a long press of the cancel button, which I find annoying. You can change the model name as well, but I'm being lazy and leaving it default for this video. It's important to name your models though, so you know which one to select when you want to change models. The model type doesn't really matter, but you can change it to helicopter here by using the up and down keys. You are going to want to navigate down to RX Setup and then down to Output and select PPM. I've also set the serial RX to iBus. You do that by pressing on the OK button again and then use the up and down buttons to select the correct option. Remember, to save you have to long press the Cancel button. If I now press cancel out of that menu, I can go down to the AUX switches. You need to make sure that all of the switches are turned on and the channel selection number is set to 10. Now, if I cancel out of there and go into the setup menu, I can navigate down to the auxiliary channels or AUX channels. I want to arm on switch A for arming and then the other three position switch for my modes. I'm going to use switch C for that. The other two switches on this transmitter are two position switches and of course we have the two potentiometers as well. So, in the menu I can use the up and down keys to cycle all the switches and dials. For channel 5 I'm selecting switch C and then I can press the OK button to move down to channel 6 and here I can select switch A for arming. And if you want to add a switch for a buzzer, you just page over and do exactly the same thing there. And again, remember to long press cancel to save the options. Lastly, I'm going to set up my failsafe, and this is something that I don't like about this receiver. It's got two buttons on it. One is the bind button, and the other says update on it for updating the firmware. Unlike FreeSky, there's no way to manually set the failsafe, which isn't a problem if you have this computer programmable transmitter. However, if you have one of the lower FlySky transmitters without the programmable display, there's no way to set the failsafe currently. So, to set the failsafe here, I need to move over to the functions menu again. I'm scrolling down to RX setup again and selecting failsafe. I need the throttle to be at zero when the transmitter loses signal with the aircraft. So, throttle is channel 3 with the FlySky protocol, so I can scroll down to it and then press OK. You then turn on the failsafe by pressing the up button and then I can use the stick to set the failsafe value. I want it to throttle to zero here so I'm leaving the stick at the bottom. Then I'm going to long press cancel to save it. I also want the quadcopter to disarm when it loses signal so I need to scroll down to channel 6 and again turn the failsafe on with the up button, then have my switch in the off position and long press cancel to save the setting. You need to long press cancel again out of that menu to save any of the settings, which is annoying, so don't let it catch you out like it has done me many times. Everything is now ready to bind the receiver. First, I'm going to turn off the transmitter. Then, you have to hold down the bind button on the receiver while powering on the quad. It's always a tricky one to do. Once the receiver is flashing, then I need to hold down the bind button on the transmitter while turning it on. You need to make sure that you've got the right model selected while doing this as well. The i6X should beep and the receiver light will go a solid red. Underneath is a built-in voltage sensor, so you can connect that directly up to the VBAT of your quadcopter if you wish, and you will then get the voltage telemetry on your main screen of the transmitter. Again, you have a servo connector for that, and I believe it will take up to a 4S. 
Over onto the other side, we have options for iBus and PPM, and again, we are given the corresponding servo connectors. iBus has a lower latency than PPM and PWM, with latency being the delay between your hands on the sticks and the signal reaching the receiver. iBus has a latency of around 7.5 milliseconds, while PPM and PWM has a latency of around 22 milliseconds. So let's go through the Betaflight setup. You get the configurator from the GitHub website, and at this point, you're going to want to plug your USB cable into the computer and the quadcopter. There's no need to plug the battery in yet. And the first thing that we're going to want to do is update the flight controller to the latest version of beta flight so you go into firmware flasher and for the mamba esc and fc combination you want the fury f4 osd then under here you're going to want to choose the latest version of beta flight now unfortunately since i started doing all of this there has been a newer version of beta flight but seeing as i've already done all of the setup i'm gonna stick with this i always choose full chip erase and that is because when they update beta flight they sometimes change the command names in the cli so if you've got an old cli dump that works well and you want to use it sometimes you'll paste it into the cli command line part and you'll get a load of errors so i usually just do full chip erase and start from scratch so next we need to go down here and load the firmware online and then flash the firmware now if everything goes well this will start moving along and it will flash and verify if you get an error up here that says something like serial it's not because it's failed to go into the DFU flashing mode it's usually because there's a driver problem so what you need to do is get a program called Zadig you need to go into the options and click list all devices and then in here you should see something called STM32 bootloader now because I'm not in DFU mode here I don't have it but what you need to do is click that and then press update or replace driver and then this is really important and it's a step that a lot of people miss once you have done that you need to unplug the usb and plug it back in to the computer and then when you press flash firmware it will go into dfu mode if you keep the copter plugged in then it will continue to not be in DFU mode properly and it won't flash. So let's connect to beta flight. So the first thing I'm going to do is go into the ports tab. So I'm using SBUS, so we are on serial RX on the UR1, and then I have used the UR3 for the smart audio, which is IRC Tramp. I've also got smart port on the UR6 for the telemetry output. If we go into the configuration, I've got it set to DSHOT 600. This is a BL Halley SESC, so you can't go any higher than that. And I always set the motor idle speed to 6% to stop flips of death happening and I always have motor stop off as well. Now if we come down here I have got the gyro update frequency and PID loop frequency set to 8k and 8k because this is an F4 so it should be able to deal with it. In fact the CPU load you can see down there very low. The maximum arm angle now for a beginner I would say leave this at 25 what it is is the angle at which the copter needs to be to arm so if it's at a tilt of more than 25 degrees then it won't arm it's for when you're carrying the copter and it's plugged in and if you accidentally hit the arming switch 
then you know it won't cut you up however it does have a downside if you are stuck in a tree and you disarm then you can't rearm it to try and wiggle it out so what I do is I set it to 180 and I take the risk so if we come down here personalization I've just got as Andy RC the receiver so we have got serial based receiver here and then S bus and of course if you're using anything else we've got I bus we've got CRSF we've just got absolutely everything supported there but of course I'm using S bus here so if we come down here I actually haven't got dynamic filter turned on and it's flying superb so I have left it I've got anti-gravity on and OSD obviously and then air mode and telemetry for the RXSR and if we come down here because I didn't install a buzzer we've got RX lost and RX set and that is everything on there I'm going to save and reboot that actually so that I can save that change that I made so let's reconnect so power and battery I have got both as onboard ADC I did change the minimum cell voltage to 2.9 and I changed the warning cell voltage to 2.9 as well the maximum cell voltage you might be confused by it is set to 5 and that is because when you add capacitors to a copter and I've done a lot of experimenting with this what can happen is when you plug the battery in the voltage actually shoots up higher than 16.8 volts it can go up to 17 sometimes 17.5 and then it reduces the voltage meter was just out a little bit the default scale is 110 it needed 109 to be accurate and the amp meter was completely out so I had to do a calibration and it might be different for everybody so I'll show you how to do a calibration so I did a flight which I have got here and I used a 1500 battery and as you can see the used milliamps here only came to 1018 milliamps so what you do to calculate the current meter is you get a calculator which I've got here and you also need a charger that will tell you how many milliamps were put back into the battery when you charged it. Now I was naughty here and look at this it went down to 9.3 volts so when I charged the battery back up it showed 1600 milliamps in fact I think it was 1630 and what you have to do then is divide that number by the number on the on-screen display so 1018 which gives me 1.6011 I'm gonna copy that then what you have to do is I'm gonna clear that now if this number is higher than what your battery is rated at then you have to times that number by 400 but mine is the opposite so it is a 1500 milliamp battery and it's reading lower so what I need to do is I need to put 400 in there and then I need to divide by that number and it gives me 249.8 I think the default is 400 now it won't let me do points so I've gone for 250 but it seemed to work because I did another flight with a 1500 milliamp battery and you can see there 14 volts 1500 milliamp there so that's how you do that if you didn't know but yeah this was way out on this flight controller and really the only downside 
So fail safe, you always need to check that the fail safe works and we'll get onto that in a bit. So if we're going to PID tuning, I think these are the stock PIDs. The great thing about Betafly is that the stock PIDs are designed for a five inch copter that is a freestyle model and is carrying a GoPro and it flew just absolutely perfect. The only thing I changed was my RC rate and the super rate and a little bit of expo in there as well. I didn't touch any of this down here whatsoever and I didn't touch the TPA either. And that is everything in there. So if we go into the receiver so yeah i'm using a tyrannis so t-a-e-r for the channel map and then i set up the rssi on channel eight so that's aux for there i put some rc deadband in there as well so modes i have got arming on the aux one and then i've got angle on the aux two over here and acro and air over here and then i have got my beeper on the aux 3. i don't use turtle mode i mention this all of the time but if you are stuck in the grass and you use turtle mode and a motor gets stuck you can burn out an esc it's not worth it in my opinion disarm go and collect the quad unless you're an avid racer and obviously it's going to affect you know the results of your race right so if we go into the motors tab because we don't need these whatsoever and this is where we need to check the motor direction so at this point we want to plug the battery in so you click this here and i'm just going to plug in the battery here and then what I'm going to do is lift up the master and if you touch each one of the motors it will tell you which direction they are going and they should be going in this direction here where the arrows are and we'll go into BL Halley Suite a little bit later and change the direction but while we are here what i'm going to do is turn on the tyrannis and we will go into the receiver tab and you'll see i've got everything working there i'm going to arm it and then i'm going to turn off the transmitter and the motors have stopped it's very important to check that the failsafe works and you can hear the motors beeping because the RX has been lost. Right, so that is that covered. But if you want to change the direction of the motors, I'm going to plug the battery back in. And what you need to do is we need to disconnect Oh, I'll turn the Tyrannus back on, otherwise it's going to keep making that noise. There we go. Right, you need to disconnect from Betaflight because it uses the same COM port and the pass-through of that COM port to get to the ESCs. So if we disconnect here, you're going to need to use BL Halley Suite and this is the non 32 bit version there are two versions so be careful and i'm going to connect to it and then if we do read setup so i had to reverse esc's one and also i had to reverse esc four and i soldered everything straight so if you did that then you'll probably have to do the same as well but once you have, you know, selected the right direction, then you can press right setup. And of course, you can go back into beta flight and back into the motors tab. Make sure you disconnect again, by the way. And again, I'll stress, 
props need to be off for this. So if we just go back into Beta Flight now and then connect to it and go into the motors tab, tick this thing there, then I can touch the motors and they're all going in the right direction. So that is absolutely fine. So next, OSD. This camera is actually the NTSC one. So I have got the RSSI on here. I have got the VTX channel because I find that really helpful when you've got smart audio. I've got the battery voltage and then we've got the current draw, we've got the craft name and then we have got the flight time and also the milliamp draw and of course you can put on there whatever you want. I've turned a couple of things off down here as well such as max speed because we haven't got GPS or anything like that. And that is everything in beta flight. I will just show you the version here so you can see that it is the Fury F4 OSD and this is version 3.52 and that is the setup. So let's take a look at some flight footage and as you can see the video feed is pretty clean. There's a little bit of noise. I did so many experiments trying to get rid of that but the only thing that did it was adding diatoms board and the unify and that is out of the budget so i hope you enjoyed this video and found it useful this flight was actually taken before i calibrated the current meter so that is showing wrong however when I did full throttle on other flights, it showed 137 amps. So yeah, it is really pulling the amps. So make sure you have a decent battery. And I've chosen this day because it is the sunniest. All of the other flights that I did were really dreary and just did not look great on the footage at all through the CCD camera. And I will leave you with some flying. This video has taken around about a month to put together, so if you can afford to do so, I'll link to my Patreon in the below. And as always, thanks so much for watching. Please continue to subscribe. Cheers.